So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the today's uh, expert talk about Azure SQL Database. I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, my name is Marek Kamal. Work as a senior cloud solution architect for data and AI. Uh, currently working with uh, with Microsoft, and I'm responsible for uh, all the data products which you can imagine, which are available in. Uh, uh, Azure, uh, Azure Cloud. So Azure SQL database would be definitely one of the primary primary ones which which are available. Uh, I have quite a bunch of uh, certifications which you can see on the slide. And uh, through the years uh, when when I was working with all the data products, I've managed to to write two books about the products, uh, especially about the SQL Server by the time of the uh, release of the SQL Server 2017 which is uh, still quite close to the Azure SQL database since uh, uh, the cloud uh, database and the on-premise database, they are close to each other and they are actually even sharing the same code base. So uh, let's see what we will talk about today. So uh, since this is supposed to be a deep dive, uh, I will just do a very brief introduction to the Azure SQL Server, uh, Azure SQL database, and then we'll go deeper into selected topics. Uh, we have roughly an hour, so I've chosen two of them, uh, security and high availability. So we'll dig deeper into these two specific topics for the Azure SQL database deployments. I will switch uh, between the slide deck and the Azure portal because I would like this to be uh, uh, a showcase of uh, what the Azure SQL database really can do and like to show you how to make the stuff happen and how to do the configuration, not just to go through the slides. So in the introduction, what's actually Azure SQL database? Azure SQL database is uh, one of the primary developers choice for intelligent cloud database service. It's a platform as a service where you are actually given a database which you can work with. And within that database, you can create all the database objects as you are used to from the on-premise uh, SQL server. Uh, with Azure SQL database, since that's a platform as a service offering, you have uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bunch of advantages. First of all, as we will see, you can really scale on the fly without any application downtime. Once we will start provisioning the Azure SQL databases, you can see there's variety of choices. If you will make a improper choice in the beginning, you can always scale your database uh, according to your needs. You can scale it up, you can scale it down, which may be a cost-effective solution. So you can change also the pricing level for your database, and you can switch between the different modes for the pricing for the database, as you will see. You can use it for building multi-tenant applications. You can uh, work within your environment, so you can just really focus on building the applications. And you can use quite a lot of security features, and I can already re reveal that some of the security features which you have within Azure SQL database are not even available within on-premise versions of the SQL Server, either 2K17 or 2K, uh, 2K19, which are are available. So Azure SQL database can bring quite a lot of features which you can't have on-premise, built-in on-premise as a first-party first party offering. When we'll talk about Azure SQL database, there's basically several types of databases which you can deploy within Azure. So when we talk about Azure SQL database that can be deployed as something what's called a single DB. That's just one single database where you have all your data, which is really suitable for applications which uh, require resources at a single database level. If you picture out how the applications can look like today, they can use just one single application, which would be totally fine. However, some of the development ways how you are building the applications, they are creating several databases, one for storing configuration, one for storing authentication information, one for storing the raw data, and so on. If single application is requiring to have multiple databases at the same time, this is not suitable for the single DB. 
The single DB really works fine as a one single database because there's several, uh, let's say, limitations uh, compared to the uh, I will usually refer to the on-premise SQL Server. So let's compare to one single point, all of those. So when you compare the single DB with on-premise type of the database, there's several disadvantages or several limitations, not disadvantages. Uh, the limitations are coming especially from the multi-database queries. So you cannot write a query which will gather data from one database and somehow combine let that be a joint operation, for example, combine the data with uh, data coming from another database. That's perfectly fine and super easy to do within the on-premise systems. However, it doesn't work with single DB. The choice in the middle, Elastic Pool, is actually not bringing that many features along. This is uh, especially super useful for cost optimization. We will talk about that a little later. Uh, when we are provisioning the database, you are actually choosing how much of system resources will be available uh, to your workload and you pay for those resources. If you are not able to utilize the resources, so you have over provisioned your system, you're just paying too much and uh, the system is not automatically adjusting to your needs. With elastic pools, this can be mitigated and multiple databases and there have to be several databases for that uh, can share the pool of system resources and that pool uh, once shared among the databases will be distributed the resources will be distributed to several databases according to their needs so if the utilization of the database varies that elastic pool will actually give out the resources only when needed. So the provisioning can be more optimized for your, uh, for your workload needs. There's one more offering, which is called Managed Instance. That's actually a little bit different because it has a little bit different way of provisioning. We will not talk about the Managed Instances today that much. Uh, managed Instance, as however uh, extremely important especially for migration scenarios and that's because the managed instance is i would say up to 99 percent compatible with uh, your on-premise sql server so it's the most easy way how to migrate the on-premise deployments to azure I'm not saying it's the cheapest and the cost optimal way how to do it. It's just the most compatible way how to do it for a lot of reasons, which we will uh, uncover a little later. When we are provisioning the databases, as you can see with single DB, you have actually four service tiers which are available today. And that's general purpose, business critical, hyperscale, and serverless. General purpose and business critical are available also for Elastic Pool and Managed Instance. As of now, I would like to stress it out, as of now, uh, nothing else is available for Elastic Pool or Managed Instance that may change in the future. So the database, when we will work with the Azure SQL database, is uh, fully managed. SQL Server database technology. It's completely enterprise ready with all the support for high availability, disaster recovery, backup scenario, replications, and way more. It scales out really well thanks to ElastiScale technology. It has a built-in regional replicas for additional protection and has a quite a high uptime SLA for 4.9 uh, high availability. When we are talking about the database, the database uh, has quite a lot of advantages. However, when we will go to the portal, we actually cannot start with the database itself. When we would like to use the databases, the first object which we have to actually provision within the Azure portal is something what's called a SQL Server. 
And the SQL Server is just this logical server, which we can create right away. As you can see, with the logical server, what we have to uh, what we have to provide is obviously the subscription, the resource group, so basic Azure stuff, and you have to enter the server name. The server name has to be uh, has to be unique has to be globally unique. So you need to figure out the naming scheme, which nobody else uh, in the world is actually using. And you can select the location for the server. Uh, I, will, I will use uh, uh, North Europe uh, for my deployment. You need to supply server admin login, and you need to supply the password. Now we have the password uh, for the Azure SQL server, the password has to be at least uh, eight characters in length. However, uh, why I'm stressing this out, uh, if you are provisioning managed instance, that has to be 16. I have no idea why. It's just different requirements by different teams. Uh, when I'm creating the server, I have supplied the name, the location uh, with networking. You can uh, allow Azure services to have access to this resource. And that's roughly it. I will review and create, and I can create the server. As you can see, we have created a SQL server where you haven't specified any version. I didn't supply anything regarding the performance. There was nothing visible regarding the pricing because the server is just the logical object. Server is a way how you can connect to your server. Uh, now the deployment is underway. So I'll, I will go to one of my existing SQL servers, which I have deployed a few minutes ago. So as you can see, this is my server name. I can copy the server name and I can go to one of the most important tools while working with the SQL server. And that would definitely be the management studio. I would highly recommend to use the latest version. As of now, by the time of the recording of the webinar, that's 18.5. Uh, and I have to supply the name of the server, and I have to select the authentication uh, authentication scheme. By default, when you start the management studio, most likely Windows authentication will be selected. However, when the SQL server is uh, uh, actually an Azure resource, and we are taught and we're talking about the uh, and we're talking about the uh, Azure deployment. Uh, you cannot utilize this Windows authentication, and we need to use this SQL Server authentication. And actually, the name and the password which I did supply during the time of the provisioning is automatically assigned access as a sysadmin uh, to the SQL Server. So I can enter the name and the password, and I can try to connect. It won't work. Uh, which is totally fine. Uh, by default, nobody is allowed to connect to that SQL Server. And that's not only about the user accounting, so it's not only about the security, it's also about the firewall rules, which are very important. Uh, you can see there's already a, a raised hand and a question, so if there's any question. Uh, uh, yes, so Mark, uh, like you said, you created the SQL logical data warehouse uh, on Azure, and you are trying to connect to that uh, SQL data warehouse uh, using a client tool. So I have not done this. I'm new to Azure. I thought to access uh, SQL data warehouse, you need a VM. Uh, but looks like you could also, like you said, if if the setting IP setting has been modified, which would allow you to connect uh, remote, so you could use your um, the tool you were displaying to connect yeah. to that instance. You could do yeah, that. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, okay. let me get a few things straight. Uh, it's it's not a data warehouse. And uh, let's be careful with data warehouse because as you can see, here is a button for new data warehouse. That's why, yeah. So data warehouse is something a little bit different. It's a smaller object than the SQL server. And on top of SQL server, I can create a database pool and a warehouse, which is renamed to Synapse SQL pool, which was previously known as Azure Data Warehouse. Uh, when the SQL server is connected, there are 
myriads of ways how you can connect to that SQL Server. What I am using mm -hmm. as okay. a tool which you can download to your laptop, which can, uh, as of now, Management Studio is available only for Windows. So if I would use uh, Management Studio, you can simply go to Google, mm -hmm. you can search for SSMS, which is the acronym for Management Studio, you have the download link. There is another tool which is called Azure Data Studio, which can connect as well. Uh, Azure Data Studio, uh, if you will download this one, that's already cross-platform. So as you can see, you can download the Azure Data Studio for Windows, Mac, and Linux at the same time. This is released. This one version was released uh, in the end of uh, in the end of April, so that's super fresh. Uh, there is one more way which can be uh, which can be used, and we can even get to the data and the databases through the portal. That's very limited, but for just writing the queries, we can work within the browser. So there is plenty of ways which would work. What I've used is the massive tool, which is uh, which is well known for SQL Server administrators, uh, Management Studio, which is available uh, for mainly on-premise installations, but works totally fine and uh, provides all the features with the Azure as well. So to be able to connect, there's already the first security feature which we have to which we have to go through. And um, as you can see, uh, one of the features which actually came across is this uh, firewall and virtual networks. As you can see, here's a list of uh, firewall rules which are available. Uh, and uh, they actually do list who can connect to that SQL server. And as you can see, the list of the rules is empty. So nobody. If I would, however, uh, choose this one option, allow Azure services and resources to access this server, uh, that will allow me, without configuring the firewall rules, that will allow me to get to the SQL server from the Azure VM. So if I would provision an Azure VM, I don't and configure this access. I don't have to configure the specific firewall rules with the IP addresses. What I will do now is I will add my client IP address. So that's my IP address. I'll just give it a name, Marx IP. I will save it. As you can see, it's safe. It's okay. Let's go back to the management studio, click on connect, and we're in. So as you can see, that's totally instant. You just click on the firewall rule and you're in. On that server, what I did before already uh, is already a database, which is called DBase, uh, database 01. So if I will expand the databases, as you can see, we already have a database. I can go to that database. I can see the tables. I can see the views. It's a database which contains some uh, sample, if you will, sample data. So I can go to the views and within the views, I can right click any object and I can select data. I will get the data from the database. Everything works perfectly fine. So as you can see, I can read all the information. Now, how these databases actually get created? That's very simple. So let's go to the portal and let's click on create database. If I will create this database, every database requires a name. That name doesn't have to be unique. I think that somebody else already came out with an idea to have a database 02, but it's totally fine since the database lives on your server. I won't use the pool as of now because it's not needed. And I can configure the database. And this is actually where we actually get to the pricing for that tool. So there are actually several ways for the pricing. One of them is based on something what is called DTU. That stands for Database Transactional Units. And it's, a, I would say, a blend between uh, CPU, memory, storage performance, and network performance. It doesn't perfectly translate. So I can't tell you that if you have, let's say, 20 DTUs, you have that much memory and you have that much uh, virtual cores allocated uh, to your system. That simply doesn't work that way. 
What I can tell you, if the database is running with 20 DTUs or 10 DTUs, those two databases, uh, uh, the database with 20 has twice as much system resources available for the performance. Uh, this is really hard to uncover how many DTUs you need for your deployment. But that really varies. Uh, and it's a, if you have no idea what your application is doing, that would be a game of guessing. Uh, however, if you're migrating any application and you are already running SQL Server, uh, we can estimate that. There is something what's called a DTU calculator, which uh, is a site which will take your performance logs from existing SQL Server, check those logs, and estimate how much of DTUs you need to provision for your system. Uh, there are three layers, let's say, basic, standard, and premium. With basic, that's really for, I would say, for development. Uh, although I have seen uh, production applications running with basic, that's a really, really, really low performance offering. Standard and premium are, on the first glance, the same. However, the premium is using SSDs and has uh, way faster storage subsystem. So it's uh, suitable for uh, applications where, which generate uh, quite a lot of I.O. and uh, require a lot of throughput. In the beginning, you can see that the maximum size for the database is just 250 gigabytes. That doesn't sound like it's really a lot. However, if you take the slider and move to the right, you can see the available size for the database is changing and is going to up to a terabyte. If a terabyte is not enough, you can always switch to premium, where actually with the lowest performance, you already start with a terabyte. And if you add more performance, you can go to up to four, and that's a limit. Uh, that's as of now. That's a that's a limit for the single DB, and uh, regardless of the pricing model, the single DB cannot be larger than four terabytes. If it's the DTU or the vCore purchasing option, since this DTU is uh, is cryptic a little, we can switch to the vCore purchasing where you can directly configure how many virtual cores, so basically like a virtual machine, if you will, how many virtual cores you would like to use for your database. So you can use two cores, four cores, even up to 80 cores. Obviously, comes with a price, right? So with 80 cores, we are roughly on 8,000 of euros per month. With just two cores, it's something about 300. So the price really varies. Uh, what we can as change configuration, as you can see, we can use different generations of the hardware for your computer. You can see that the max storage is always four terabytes, and you even can conf you actually cannot, but you can see the maximum memory. If we will stay with the Gen 5, which is the latest which we will use, as you can see, we are assigning just the cores, not the memory because the memory is basically automatically calculated. What you get here is roughly 5.5 gigabytes per core. So if you have two cores, your system is using around 11 gigabytes of RAM. If you switch to four cores, you're suddenly working with 22. So the memory is automatically calculated based on the amount of the cores. And as you can see, if you add more cores, you sort of unlock the option to use more data. So with 24 cores, you can already have a database for up to four terabytes. Again, the business critical and the general purpose, these two layers, uh, the main difference between those two 
as IO operations, as you can see, this is uh, ending with 20,000. This one goes to 200,000 and the latency, which is way lower for business critical, again, due to the storage. In the middle of them, there's something very, very special. That's hyperscale. Hyperscale is a technology which dramatically changes how the SQL Server is actually provisioned. There's even a checkbox which tells, as of now, uh, that if you will choose hyperscale, you cannot change it later. And that's very important. However, with hyperscale, as you can see, there's no more a limit for the storage. You can have as many cores as you want, and the slider for the storage has disappeared. Because hyperscale allows you to create a database with an astonishing size of 100 terabytes, which is super, super huge. However, you cannot change it later to any other, any other performance layer. It comes with few limitations as well. So if I will choose, let's say a basic, I can choose the basic size. I can go to networking. There's as of now, nothing important we have to configure because everything is sort of inherited from the server layer. And I can choose again, the sample or a blank database. There's also something called backup. We'll get to that backup a little later because backup works a little bit differently. Uh, it doesn't directly use backups which you can provide it's a backup of existing databases which you have on your server on your deployment so i will create a sample database click on review and create click on create and we will have a database within a few seconds so the database will be online now when we have the sql database available it's totally compatible with sql server it's using the very same dialect the same TSQL language. It's using the same data types. It's using the same clients, which is very important. So same management studio, same visual studio, uh, same protocols. It actually even shares code base with on-premise SQL server. So if application works with on-prem, there is a super high chance it will work correctly with Azure as well. With Azure, what you get is something what's called cloud first release model. So new features, they go to Azure SQL database way before they are going into the SQL Server product. Uh, this was uh, uh, very remarkable with uh, on-premise version of SQL Server 2K16, where plenty of the security features were available for months and years within Azure before they made it actually into the on-premise version, which is, uh, which is a big advantage, I would, I would totally say. So the single database is hosted on the logical server, as we have seen. When the server is a, a, a logical entity for grouping several different types of the databases, you can mix and match. You can have databases provisioned as DTUs, as V cores, combine them with even the analytical databases like Synapse. Uh, the database is a logical server, which doesn't mean uh, that the databases do run on the same physical hardware. They are absolutely not doing that. Uh, and it's also a tool for login, uh, login management. So we're mapping logins to database users, thanks to the server. However, when we have provisioned the Azure SQL database, there's plenty of limitations. And uh, some of the limitations do come from comparison to the SQL server. Uh, if you compare the on-prem SQL server and the Azure SQL database, you're missing plenty of the services. One major service which you will miss is SQL Server Agent. And this is huge because anything what has something to do with automation within the on-premise system is missing. Uh, so you need to figure out a different way how to do nightly jobs, how to do hourly maintenance, how to do automated imports, exports, whatever you need. Uh, so this is not supported as of now. Some of the 
services can be replaced with different Azure services or uh, Azure offerings like Azure SQL Elastic Job, Azure Automation, Azure Function, with SQL Server integration services. What you can do is you can use Azure Data Factory. Instead of uh, SQL Server Analyzer services, you can use to some extent uh, Azure Analyzer services, which are not one-to-one -one mapping, but they do work perfectly fine. Instead of reporting services, you can use Power BI and plenty of others. With the DTU and vCore model, which we have seen, you have this in the slides or, and uh, within the recording, uh, you can see how to correctly uh, scale your storage versus compute needs. Uh, this is uh, very important because uh, although you need quite a lot of compute resources, you don't have to scale the storage as well, and the storage scaling is uh, more flexible with the vCore uh, purchasing model compared to the DTU. With the uh, very performant databases on the DTU model, you have the highest storage capacity. Uh, you can have the large storage capacity with quite a low vCore purchasing model, which allows you uh, way more flexibility, control, and transparency for, uh, for your deployment. So we have already provisioned the SQL Server and the database at the same time, and we have configured one of the slight security features to be able to connect. Now, when the database is actually running, we need to start thinking about the security because security is very imperative today. It's one of the core deployment considerations which you need to make. And Azure SQL Database offers you really plenty. So what we have seen is the server firewall, which you can configure within the portal. So anybody who's listed, who's whitelisted actually on that firewall can get access to that database. However, what you can do as well as you can create a database firewall. So for each and every database, you can have different set of rules for allowing connections from your applications, virtual machines, desktops, other servers, and so on. Database firewall, however, can't be clicked through the portal. You won't find any database firewall on the database. You have to do it via Management Studio. And within the Management Studio, you need to run a specific stored procedure. So you will need to execute a stored procedure, which is used for uh, uh, speed database firewall for creating uh, for creating the firewall rules uh, and those can be configured directly on the database level which helps a lot uh, with authentication what we have seen uh, you can basically use the login which you have created and when you log into that uh, Azure SQL server you can see your security here's my login here's the login which I have created during the provisioning and obviously you can create a new one. So you can create a login. Uh, login will be, let's say, test. And that login needs to have a password. If I'm creating the login through the management studio, unfortunately, I would need to type in a password. So I'm not creating that login. So you can see the password and login to my SQL server. Uh, I don't like that. Uh, and uh, uh, Obviously, there would be ways how to do this uh, in a little bit more secure way. However, that's very important part for the accounting. So we can have logins which are managed directly by the SQL Server. So this has advantages and disadvantages at the same time. Advantages, uh, super easy to use, supported all the way around. This has been around for ages. Uh, disadvantage. Definitely, if you uh, will create a login on a server, that login won't be available elsewhere on any other server. So if you like to have the same login on multiple servers, you need to go to multiple servers and you need to create 
the same login on multiple servers several times. Watch is still fine, but consider changing the password. You need to go to each and every server with that login, change the password properly, and what if you will forget or skip one server? And the application will, for example, fail over and everything will collapse. So that's why what you can use actually as authentication through Azure Active Directory. It doesn't work with just Active Directory, which is a Windows server feature, but you need to use AAD, Azure Active Directory. With Azure Active Directory, what you are creating is a login, and you need to create that login as it's called external login. And with that external login, you're not supplying the password. That's somebody else's job. That's job for Azure Active Directory to manage the credentials. So if you have multiple servers, you will create that same login around multiple servers, and you still have to do that several times. But if the password has to be changed, it's changed on one single spot within Azure Active Directory. And regardless of how many servers you have, they will use the current authentication credentials. So if you will authenticate to any of the servers, with your updated password, it will work correctly, which is a huge advantage. Uh, with the Management Studio, if you like to use that, that's actually a little bit different because it's not this Windows authentication, it's this Azure Active Directory authentication, which you have to use for the connection. And when we will dig deeper to the security, Azure Active Directory, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, by default, and that's a huge advantage, I would say, all the databases are encrypted. And they are encrypted on the storage. So when the database is saved on the storage system anywhere in the Azure Data Center, that's already encrypted and protected. You can use, however, more uh, encryption schemes and encryption features to encrypt the data even within the database. And also the connection to the database is encrypted at the same time. And this is again a huge advantage compared to the uh, regular on-premise SQL Server deployments, where many of these features are sometimes an enterprise addition feature. Not everybody is running with enterprise. And some of them do require additional configuration like transparent data encryption or TLS connection encryption and plenty of others. A uh, few things which I would like to point out uh, are auditing and threat detection combined with uh, vulnerability assessment and data discovery and classification. So let's go to the portal. Uh, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to our SQL Server. And on the SQL Server, what we can configure is something what is called Advanced Data Security. We can turn this on. It's not for free. This will cost, uh, cost me 12 uh, euro per server per month. So let's turn this on. And uh, what this actually brings as uh, vulnerability assessment settings which can be running on periodic uh, on periodic occasions. I can send the reports or I can just have uh, the uh, periodic scans. Uh, they need to be obviously stored to a storage account. So I need to uh, create a storage account. So let's have a storage account for the vulnerability scans, and we'll see what, what's actually inside of those. So within a few few seconds, we will see what's the content of those scans. Merrick? Yeah? So, so the logical SQL database you created, uh, you didn't have to have a storage account for that? No, absolutely not. Isn't that part of a storage, or you don't? No. No, it's not a part okay. of the storage. It's using its own 
mechanism how to store the data, but the regular Azure storage account, as you know, that service, you know, the blob storage, it's not required right. to create the database. This is just required for uh, this vulnerability assessment. And what I will configure is also the uh, threat protection settings. And I will go inside of those. And here are all the threat protection uh, uh, mechanisms which uh, which you can enable. So it can detect the SQL injection. It can even spot the vulnerability for SQL inject injection. It can detect data exfiltration, any unsafe actions, brute forcing into your database. Somebody is trying to log in uh, too many times uh, or even some anomalous client logins. Uh, plenty of these uh, are not even available with on-premise system, which is really huge. And for 12 euro per month, this is really worth it. So I will turn this on. And let's go to let's go to the security features. Once it's turned on, I can go to my database. I have my database right here. And with advanced security, if it's already turned on and we have this turned on, you will see that First of all, data discovery and classification is already uh, already running. It's recommending to classify some columns. Uh, it's, uh, the vulnerability assessment is yet not available. Uh, and the advanced threat protection uh, didn't yet spot any high severity alerts or medium severity alerts. So let's check on the vulnerability assessment. Uh, come on, we have the storage account. Uh, It's not created yet. Yeah, we have the search account. So what's the what's the deal here? Uh, So let's create the storage account one more time. Something that just happened. Should validate, should be on. So the storage account is okay. It's created, scans can be configured. Save it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, got it. Uh, it's just that uh, that on my part. Uh, so let's do the uh, let's go to that uh, storage account. Uh, storage accounts. Uh, go to the storage account. Go to the containers, and I didn't have the container uh, scans. Okay. So let's have a container uh, because the container can't be empty, obviously. And let's go back to the SQL, back to the advanced security, grab that storage account we have. Uh, why it's not searching that storage account correctly? It's not loading my accounts. Something weird is happening. We have two storage accounts and it's not linking to that SQL server. I oh, never mind. Uh, it should show up correctly, and uh, if it would, which I'm really sorry for not showing up, uh, as uh, we would see uh, the vulnerability uh, assessment and we will directly see some of the recommendations and some of the failures even, because with sample data, uh, you can have several of the failures, uh, several of the failures already, 
like uh, allowing uh, uh, high security principles to have access to the database, uh, uh, not using uh, individual users and plenty of others. So uh, if this is running uh, on a recording basis, this can actually spot on uh, some of the some of the things which you might not think of directly uh, directly in the beginning. Uh, plenty of other features uh, do exist, like role of security, like uh, uh, dynamic data masking, which can help you uh, protect your data and even comply with plenty of regulatory compliance, like uh, PCI DSS, HIPAA, any ISOs, uh, GDPR, and plenty of others which, uh, which do exist. Uh, with the database, uh, uh, with the database security, what you have is actually your data, which can be encrypted at rest, can be encrypted in use, can be encrypted in flight. So when the database is stored, we're using an encryption of the storage. When the data is transferred on the network, we use uh, SSL slash TLS. When the data is being used, we use a technology which is called always encrypted to really encrypt the data inside of the database. So you can encrypt specific specific columns uh, in uh, in the tables which uh, which you consider really sensitive. Uh, you can uh, use something what's called dynamic data masking, where unprivileged users won't see the full data record. Imagine you have, let's say, a credit card number uh, stored within your database, which is uh, not encrypted. It's all wrong already, right? But when it is stored that way, you don't want anyone to be able to just run select star from table and read your credit card numbers. What you can do here is you can use dynamic data masking. And if anybody except sysadmins, that's a little bit special group of people, uh, will query the data, they will see just a partial record of that credit card number. Let's say four last digits uh, and nothing else, which is really nice for any sort of verifications and all that stuff, but the full data record won't be revealed. Uh, for data protection, uh, it's not really protection per se, but you can use data discovery and classification, which uh, can help you actually spot if you have any sensitive data in the database. If you need to take any extra cautious, uh, uh, if you have any personally identifiable information, any information which should be encrypted, any information which should be super protected because they do contain sensitive stuff. This is based on the column level, uh, column names, so the system is automatically checking how your structure of the data is looking like, and if to make any recommendations, the discovery and classification is basically a recommender in the beginning. It can recommend what to classify and how to classify. You can add your own, obviously. With access control, you have basically all what you have with regular SQL Server. So you have the permissions, you have the row level security, column level security. So all the stuff which is uh, basically available with on-premise deployments. For authentication, you can use the SQL, which we have seen, and you can use Active Directory. With network security, we have seen the firewall on the server and database level. And you can also use the virtual networks. What you can do is you can link the SQL server, for example, with your VMs. So the communication can go through the VNet because the virtual network is available to your virtual machines, right? When you provision a virtual machine, it usually has a VNet associated. You can configure the Azure SQL database not to be, or basically the SQL server, not to be accessible by public endpoint. So the connection through the internet, because that's basically exposed to the internet, right? Uh, the connection to the internet can be totally blocked. And it can communicate only with the services 
which are within your deployment in Azure. So the virtual machines, any application services, other SQL servers, other database stuff, whatever you need. With threat protection, you have obviously the advanced uh, threat protection, auditing, any vulnerability scans, data classifications, and plenty of other features. Uh, what we have seen is the advanced protection. However, there's plenty, plenty more, like dynamic data masking, which can be used, uh, where, as you can see, you have some of the columns, like, uh, let's say, email address. So you can add a mask, and uh, with email address, the masking which we can use is this email format. So I will update the masking rule. We update it and let's save it. And now if a user will go to the database and will select the data from this table, they will see an email only in this format. So the first letter from your email address and the top level domain, the rest will be hidden. Obviously you can think of your own mechanisms, what to hide, how to hide it, what portion can be, uh, can be hidden. So you can have your own custom. There's several which are predefined. So you can have default, you can have specific credit card, as you can see, just last four digits. You can have email and you can have custom. So your own custom string, what to expose, what to hide, what to what to pad basically. So you can hide the data from, from the users within the database. Role of a security, that's a little bit more complex. So we'll uh, just, uh, just keep it that way. Uh, with transparent data encryption, as you can see, it's already on. It's by default on. Uh, Unlike with, uh, if I will create this uh, synapse pool, uh, if anything hasn't changed, the synapse pool wasn't using encryption by default. I will talk about the synapse pools uh, uh, on a next Azure SQL talk, which is scheduled like within a week or so. And uh, uh, we'll talk about the features uh, of that one uh, a little bit later. Uh, that one by default wasn't using the encryption at all. Uh, one of the things which uh, I would like to show is uh, that I have actually multiple SQL servers. I have created several. So I have uh, one for the Synapse and I have three for SQL. So server one, server two, and server three. And we can use that for high availability. Uh, Basically, when the database is created and we have a database in here, that database is protected. Automatically, the system is storing multiple copies within the data center. You don't have to do anything about that. That just works. And it's automatically doing the backups. You even cannot change the way how it's doing backups. What you can do is just to configure for how long it's storing the backups. And be very careful because by default, it's just seven days. You can change it, however. You can go to configuration, you can configure something what's called retention, and the retention period can be up to 35 for something what is called point in time restore. This means that the system is periodically taking enough backups so it can restore the database to any given point in time within 35 days. That's a max. Obviously, you would need to have longer backups, right? So you can configure something what is called long-term retention. So for example, a backup for the uh, first backup of the month, you can store for up to 10 years. That's a max. If you need to store it for more, not possible, basically. 10 years is a max. You can configure for the first backup of the month. Uh, you can configure the weekly backup and you can configure an uh, yearly backup. So for example, from the first week 
or from the last week. That would make most sense, but you can choose any week which fits your needs. You can configure, again, that backup to be kept for maximum of 10 years. A uh, few things uh, worth mentioning here. Uh, let's go with this one, which is basic. So configure attention. Uh, let's choose 14. Let's choose apply. And it will tell you not an option. So the basic one is actually really using up to seven days worth of point in time restore. It cannot use any longer period. It's available only with standard, premium, or vCore purchasing model. Now, another uh, noteworthy uh, uh, comment. Let's say we have the backups here. Those backups, they are for free. They are happening for free and they are stored for free. However, let's take this one database. We have the database 02. I can configure the database and I can change the database to be vCore purchased, just like that. So it's just a matter of clicking. And automatically the database will become the vCore provision. It will change from basic. It will change to a different scale to a different generation of hardware. So there will be a lot of uh, mumbo jumbo happening in the background, but basically the database will become a different type of the database. It takes time. It's not completely instant, right? So it will take a small time till we can see, especially on this overview, till we can see the basic changed to the vCore purchasing model. Uh, can take a few minutes maybe, let's say, uh, however, what's important to note here is if the purchasing model is already this vCore purchasing model, those backups are not stored for free anymore. You are actually paying for the storage as a part of the database, uh, as a part of the database price. It's automatically stored in Azure Storage account. As you can see, it's already changed. Uh, it's uh, not a storage account which you have direct access to. But you will you will know about that storage account on your monthly bill. So that's worth mentioning. Now, when I have the database, let's say this one, what I can do very quickly is a geo replica of the database. And as you can see, I have the database in uh, Europe North, and I can replicate the database, for example, to West Europe because in the West Europe, I already have a server. So I can choose that server. Uh, it can be readable. The database name will be the same and so on. And now the pricing tier. As you can see, I cannot choose basic or the premium, but I can choose the pricing layer. So I can choose how many DTUs I should assign, and they don't have to match. So if you have a powerful server in one region, which is used by default, you can have a low performance replica for cost saving in another region. However, if an incident will occur, you have to change your application code a little. You have to change the connection because that won't switch automatically. It's a different server name that database will live on different server. I will click on apply, click OK, and we'll start replicating. It will take a small amount of time. It will initialize and replicate the data and we'll get online very quickly. Those two data centers have uh, quite a good connection between them, so it should be perfectly fine. As you can see, it's already seeding and it should be, uh, it should be really fast. Yeah, it shouldn't take that long to, to see the data. The database is super small anyway. So the seeding should be uh, seeding should be very fast. Uh, I can have multiple replicas. I can choose any other any other region. By all means, it's not a problem. Uh, as you can see, even North Europe is still visible. So I can go to North Europe and I can choose another target server. So I can have two servers within North Europe and I can have actually multiple copies within North Europe region if I want to. 
I won't do that. Uh, as you can see, see, it's still seeding, but it will take just a small time. What I can do as well is, however, this is a little bit more complex, and this works not on the database, but on the server level. And this is important to understand what level are we talking about. If it's on the database, we use GeoReplicas. If it's on the server, we use something what's called a failover group. And we can create a group of servers. That group uh, has a name. As you can see, the name, again, has to be unique. It needs to have a secondary server. can be from the same region, so let's use a different region. Uh, it has a policy for failover, uh, for grace period, what will be the databases within the group, 